Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Today we're going to talk about the procedure for making primary impressions. This procedure is done at clinic number one for a patient that has been approved for denture therapy. So we're going to talk about impression selection, tray selection, the procedure for each impression material, followed by the disinfection method and writing the laboratory form. So let us begin first of all by selecting the impression material. There are two materials approved for denture primary impressions for a patient that has a dentulous ridge with no big problems and we have the options between compound and alginate. There are some specific indications where I need to shift to alginate and these are written in your uh, theoretical material. So this first we have to select the material, then we select the trays. The trays we have can be categorized by their material, either made of metal or alloy or made of plastic. It could be selected by the form of the tray if it was for a dentulous, meaning it has a cross section that is circular, and that usually fits an edentulous patient that usually has this cross section, circular section, for the edentulous ridge. While we have some trays specific for dentate patients where teeth are present, so to accommodate the space for the teeth, we need the tray to be vertically high with a deep sulcus around because the vertical height between the occlusal surface and the sulcus is large if we compare it with the edentulous patient. So for this case, as a dentate patient, we should select dentate trays and these are determined by the cross section of their morphology. So they have the square morphology with a deep sulcus. We have problems if we take impressions for edentulous patients using these trays, we will have the following problems. For example, this is an edentulous case taken with a dentate tray. You can notice that we will have problems with the sulcus depth. It will be beyond the sulcus depth. That will traumatize the patient. You will have uneven thickness on the left and the right and you will have also some vertical height that is large and that will take a lot of impression material. So it's better to take a good impression to utilize the correct tray for the correct case. Okay? And we will not have those problems once we select this tray which has this half circular shape for its cross section. So we're not going to select these. And we're going to select the trays that are suitable for edentulous patients. Can you please now raise and go to the distribution table to select your impression material and the trays. For each group, just for a moment to say, each group will have two casts, one upper, one lower. You are going to select an, up, an impression for the upper and an impression for the lower of different material. So you will be getting the impression material of both types. Each group, composed of five students, will get, will have the casts with them, and they will select one metal tray, one plastic tray for alginate. Make sure that these are opposite. So if you select the upper metal tray, select with it a lower plastic tray, and so on, to make sure that you are exposed to both cases with the different material. Now that you have selected your trays, we're going to begin with taking the procedure for taking impression. The procedure for taking impression includes the selection of the tray, which you have already done, checking the size of the trays on your case, so it's the selection of the size, then the selection of the retention form. You might need a specific retention form for each uh, impression material. On the 
selection of tray sizes, we need to note that patients in general don't have the same size of ridge. Some patients have wide ridges, some patients have narrow ridges, sometimes the lower are also different. We have different morphologies of the edentulous ridge. So these different sizes that occur naturally between patients because of the bone size would mean that we need to select the tray size. There is no one tray to fit all patients. So when we're going to do the tray selection, we do it inside the patient's mouth. But today, for the purpose of demonstration, we're going to look at the case that we have and which we consider as a patient case. This is the model for the patient that you have. And we're going to use this cast to determine the size of the tray that we're going to use. In general, we have upper trays, and we identify them by the continuous palatal area. And we have the lingual trays, where on the lingual side, we don't have any metal. This is the lingual side. So upper trays, lower trays, we have an array of these. And now we're going to talk about sizing of the tray in comparison with the material that we're going to use, which is compound, impression compound. And once we talk about the size, we'll talk a bit more about alginate as well. So we want to select the size. We go with the trays that are available at our clinic. Usually, if this was the upper, the patient will be in this direction, and we will be placing the tray from front to back. Now, how do we know or see the size of the tray? We have the ability to see it for inside the patient's mouth just by looking at this triangle. So we try to, so if this, if this was the patient, we would look while tilting the tray and only leaving it touching on the distal surface. You might notice that it's only touching here on the tissue. So we would look and see that you would find that these margins are hitting in the cheek areas, okay? And they are distorting the tissue. And even when we seat it, try to seat it, we find that the anterior area is even and sometimes going out of the lip. So these are signs that this uh, tray is large. If I, we have the advantage here because this is a cast, if we put the tray in like this, we could further see the impingement of the tray on the soft tissue on the sides, the large space between the ridge and the edges of the flanges. So this tray is large. If we choose another tray, the contrast tray, which is the small one, if I'm looking inside the patient's mouth and this is the upper, I would find that the flanges of the tray are hitting on the ridge itself. Okay, or sometimes it's short from the hamular area. So if I want to know the size, I would put, as we said, the distal surface of the tray on the hamular area and then try to see it and see the location of the tray. If I see that the flanges are hitting the sides of the, the ridge here, that means the size is small. And sometimes it hits from anterior, so this flange sometimes hits here. So this is telling me that this tray is small. And for compound, we need around five to seven millimeters of space around. So this is a small tray. We could further see it if we're looking backwards. You could see that the flanges of the tray are very close to the posterior part of the ridges and with no space for impression material to be located. They are exactly on the slopes of the ridge. So this is a small tray. Let's go to the ideal tray, which is the, this size. So once more, we put it inside the patient's mouth. We fit the hamular area of the tray on the hamular area of the patient, and we try to take the size of it, and we find this does not impinge on the soft tissue around, and it leaves a sufficient space. And this is how we check the size. So it leaves sufficient space around it for impression material. So if I bring the uh, size that we have chosen for this patient, I put the hamular area of the tray on the hamular area of the patient, and then I seat the tray. I find that the tray has a space all around the ridge. It's not hitting, the flanges are not hitting in the cheek area, and I have sufficient space between the tray and the soft tissue for my compound material. And this is the ideal size for the upper. If we're just going to quickly repeat it for the lower, we have the same thing, we have different sizes, and we have the lower ready for us. For inside the patient's mouth, we're going to put the tray from front to back. And once more, we're going to flip it open like this. We're going to place the 
distal part on the retromolar pad area and then try to see it. If we find that the tray is hitting the cheek, you can notice that it's hitting the cheek, it's advanced anterior, more anterior. So if it's hitting on the cheek area, this is large. If it's hitting on the side and the buccal pouch area, especially in the patient will be complaining sometimes from this tray, this means the size is large. So we omit this from our selection. I'm going to go immediately do, to the small one. And once more, I'm looking at the small one. If I put the distal part on the retromolar pad area, I would find that these flanges are exactly over the ridges and they're not fitting. And these lingual sides are going too much inside towards the tongue area. So also this is not fitting. It's small in the lingual area. And if we go to the one that we have chosen for this patient, once more distal surface on the retromolar pad area and then try to seat it, we find that it seats well. We have sufficient space around the ridges for our compound material. Remember that compound need around five to seven millimeters of space around the tray. And we also can have the same space anteriorly while the tray is still stable and located correctly. So this is a note about the size. So let's go through the procedure for compound. So you have your patient ready, you have your metal trays ready, you have the compound cake ready. And you will also need warm water. This warm water should be around 45 to 55 degrees. And in a simpler way, if you have gloved hands and you put your finger in that temperature, you can stand the temperature. It is hot a bit, but it's standable. You can tolerate the temperature on your finger while it's gloved. And that's the temperature suitable for compound. And finally, you should have a gauze to put in the water because once compound is heated, it becomes flowable and sticky. And that's a feature of the presence of wax uh, in it one of its components, it becomes sticky. So you don't want the compound to, be, to become sticky around the, the rubber bowl. So we just line it with the gauze, we dip, dip in it in the water, and then we place the impression compound in, inside that warm water to heat it. If you are taking an upper impression, please select cake and a half. If you're doing the lower impression, just use one cake, please. Now we're going to begin with the procedure. So we take our gauze, spread it in the warm water, and then dip in it inside that warm water. We bring the amount of compound we need. For, I'm going to begin with the lower impression compound and I'm going to put in one cake to heat it. Once it becomes warm enough, you can notice that it can change in form. And this is the way it sets. So it's a thermal reaction where it becomes soft and once it cools, it goes back to become hard. And this is the function of the wax components inside this impression compound. You also have a filler to make sure that the waxes don't flow too much and become liquid. We still need the form of it. So that's the function of the filler. So now you notice that it had become soft. I can knead it using inside like a dough. I can manipulate it with my fingers. Okay. You can see if it becomes a sticky, that means the temperature of the water needs to be lowered. You knead it into the form of a, a ball, and you make sure that it's heated evenly. So we're making sure that it is warm enough and uniform. And now I'm going to knead it or manipulate it until it becomes like a small ball. For the lower tray, this small ball, I need first of all to lengthen it into a tube form. If I feel that it's still not playable enough, 
I soak it in the warm water once more to make sure I could manipulate it correctly. Now that I have soaked the material, just enough to have it smooth and playable, I put some Vaseline on my gloves and then I mold it into a shape of a ball. Then, because I'm using this for the lower impression, I make it in this form as a, an elongated tube. And in this tube, I spread it a bit from the middle, making the bulk of the material on the sides. And then I load the tray with this material. The material itself, I load it into the tray, I press it into place. Excess material that goes out to this side, I reorganize it and repress it into its location. I make it more uniform. I press the material in the middle, making sure it's adapted to the tray. I press the material on the sides, the excess material on the sides, I re-enter it into the tray, locate it inside the tray. I smoothen the surface because a, an excellent impression should have no creases on it. So there are no creases, crease lines or fold lines coming from the compound. And I also lengthen the compound on the lingual side of it. Because usually in the edentulous patient, we have what we call the lingual pouch. This lingual pouch is deep on the lingual side. And many times during taking impressions, this material, this area is not recorded correctly. So I try to squeeze some of the excess material from the tray into that area to make sure that it's long, it has enough material to, to record that area. No creases are on board now, on the impression. I might just place a small groove with my finger. Just this will easily locate the sulcus while inside, it's inside the patient's mouth. I reheat it, making sure I soak it once more because I, during the manipulation with my fingers, the impression material became a bit cool. So I need it to go back to the consistency with the correct temperature. And once now it's correct, and it's ready, and it is easily manipulated, I place it inside the patient's mouth. So if I'm taking the impression from the inside of the patient's mouth, I send the cheek away by one side, and my finger is enlarging the other side, and I go inside to the patient's mouth, and then with me in front of him, I should be in front of him, but for the demo purpose, I'm behind him. And I'm in front of him, and then I press firmly on both sides until the material is set. In this case, it's not a chemical reaction. The setting is simply cooling of the tray. My assistant, if my assistant is close by, I ask her to use the air syringe to eject air, cold air, to the tray, and this will make the setting or the uh, cooling of the impression material faster. The impression material, once it cools, it will hold its form and it will take an impression of the patient. We're going to repeat the impression, but this time using a cast, just to show you the procedure. Now for the lower, we're going to use one cake. And we're going to use the tray that we have selected. Once more, we have washed it off, so if any remnants of saliva is there, or any other uh, material is totally removed, it's totally dry. So the stickiness of the impression compound itself will stick to the tray and retain it. This tray also has a margin, a rim. This rim, this inverted rim, will also help maintain the impression material once cooled down. So the material is soft enough, we can manipulate it easily. I put it in a ball shape and for the, because this is a lower I'm going to make it in a rod shape squeeze it from the middle of it because we want more bulk of material on the sides and then load it in the tray trying to squeeze the material into the spaces beneath it I also Put it back because I want it to warm up a bit more because while I'm, in, I'm manipulating by my fingers, it cools down. So 
so back to being warm I smoothen the surface and begin building the excess into the lingual pouches these are the lingual pouch areas this is one I'm going to also build this if I take the impression like this it will become deficient so I have to put the material by my hand in this area and load it vertically so the material will flow vertically rather than escaping from behind and now once this ready and still soft I could feel it still soft I'm going to put it in the patient's mouth orient it to the left and right and make sure it is totally centered and then begin pressing by two fingers inside the patient's mouth at this stage I squeeze it into place and then begin telling the patient, can you please move your tongue to the left and right? The movement of the tongue to the left and right will mold this area. And also by my fingers from front, I bring, take the tissue or the cheek and begin molding the impression material in this area. You will find that the material is moving towards the tray and taking the exact position of the sulcus. Once more, ask the patient to move the tongue to the left and right, and this will mold the lingual area. So the excess material on the lingual area will be removed. And we maintain this until it cools down. We keep maintaining it until it cools down, and once it's cool, we can simply remove it by snap removal from inside the patient's mouth. And now I compare this with what I have in the tissue. I would find that my sulcus all around is continuous and one roll. There are no deficiencies in the sulcus. It's rounded. I have the indentation of the frenae in it. The buccal frenae and the lingual, the lingual and the labial frenae are there. I find that my lingual sulcus is also continuous. I find that I have recorded in full depth the lingual pouch area. If I want to make sure I've recorded it well, I simply put my finger from the retromolar pad downwards inside the patient's mouth and take a measurement and then invert it on the impression itself and see is this measurement there or not that means I have recorded it fully so this is the lower impression also ready for the now for the upper impression we're going to use a cake and a half we're going to place it with gauze into the warm water we're going to wait for it to warm up we're going to prepare our upper cast make sure it has Vaseline on it to make sure that you can remove the impression easily and while it's warming take it out and keep try trying to move it around to make sure that the heat penetrates into the inner sides of the cakes because impression compound is not a good thermal conductive material so it makes we need to make sure that the heat goes and infuses into the inside of the impression material with the Vaseline on your gloves. It's very tacky, as you can notice. Going to rotate it. Now it's ready. So what we're going to do, we're going to put it in a circular form, in a ball shape. And we're going to load the upper tray. For the upper tray to load it, we first place this dough as a ball shape in the palatal part and then begin squeezing the excess material into place anteriorly. We want the tray surface to be evenly filled. Any creases on the surface we remove them. Any excess the material on the palate we, are, we make sure that it's uh, pushed away because this will, if left, will flow into the throat of the patient and increase what we call gagging reflex meaning that the patient would not tolerate it and begin doing the movement of throwing up. And we don't want this bad uh, side effect for the patient. So we make sure that any mat excess material on the palatal side is pushed to the end of the tray, while the excess material, once more, we build in what we call the buccal pouch. And it's also the deepest area in the patient's mouth, inside the patient's mouth from the buccal side. So to make sure that the material flows into that area not, rather than escaping, we take some of the excess material from the sides of the tray and we, we load it to make this area a bit larger or taller. And then, once we have the surface smooth, I can use my finger just to place a small groove, a very shallow groove, 
this will help me locate the ridge because inside the patient's mouth, I'm not sure if I'm to the left or to, to the right, but the groove will help me. It will be over the ridge. Once I've loaded the tray correctly, I put it back and soak it for a while inside the water to make sure it warms up again. Because sometimes while I'm loading, as I told you,